Hi and welcome to Playford Uniting Church Online. For those who don't know me, I'm Nat and I've previously been on my couch at home enjoying watching Playford Uniting Church Online. But today I get the privilege of being here on camera with you. So please join us today as we worship together, we enjoy Nick's nuggets, a message from Pete and at the end we'll be celebrating communion together so don't forget your bread and juice. Please worship with us now. And I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my too. Till I met you And I was breathing together the two. 
with the Lord. And though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart,
Welcome to Nick's Nuggets. I am Nick, and this is Nuggets. Now, you might remember last week, we were talking about the Holy Spirit and the tongues of fire. And now Nuggets say to me, I want to make the tongues of fire headband. So look, he did this all by himself. He's very clever. You're a good boy, Nugget. Ow, that hot. You don't use real tongues of fire. I thought it was a cardboard cutout. It real. Oh my goodness, I'm taking that off now. Oh. Nugget, you're crazy. Anyway, Nugget said to me during the week, he very excited because he found this new thing to play with. It got all the colored plastic shapes and you put them together and you can build all sorts of things. And I said to Nugget, oh, what this called? And he said, it called the Leggio. And I say, the what? And he say, the Leggio. You know, the plastic shapes. You stick it together and build things all up high. And I say, oh, Nugget, you mean the Lego. And Nugget thinking, oh, I thought Lego was that tomato paste. I say, no, Nugget, that's Lego with an S, Legos. Now Nugget really confused. I think Nugget always confused. But anyway, that's okay. So he said to me, he liked to play with the Lego, it bringing him lots of joy and happiness. He can build things really high, like a big tall tower. He can build a house. He can build a rocket ship. He can build a racing car. He can build whatever he wants to build. But then some other people, they come up and they knock it down. And he said, what do you do that for? So then he have to build another tower. And he built it even higher this time. But then somebody else come and they knock it down again. And now Nugget, he feeling sad. And he get a little bit angry now. He say, I don't know if I want to build a Lego anymore. Because people come knock it down. I think I will stop trying. This is bad. These people, they should encourage, not knock things down. Because when we build the best things, we don't want to knock them down. Why do you want to do that for? And, you know, I say to Nugget, you know, Nugget, maybe this is kind of like people sometimes are. Because we can build people up with encouragement and show friendship and show love. And this makes them feel peace and joy and confident inside. But when we act mean or rude, this brings people down. It makes them feel sad and makes them feel hurt. We should not do this. This is really bad. We should always try to keep building people up, not destroy them like those silly people with the Lego. They're terrible. But we should not just build them up with friendly words, but we should use encouraging faith as well. So what does that mean? Well, that means we should encourage them to read the Bible and we should encourage them to pray lots to God and we should encourage people to share the stories of how God is blessing them. This is good. This will be building the people up. This is wonderful. I think Nugget even liked this idea. Now, don't forget, um, we have lots of activities you can do. And we have this girl called Little Annie, and she sent in some of her activities. So look what we got here. We got the Pentecost lantern that she make. Look at this. She's very clever. And we got the Pentecost wind chime. See? You hang it out in the wind and it blows around. Whoosh, oh, she's very clever, this little Annie. So if you do some activities or some coloring sheets that you'll find on the internet thingy that your parents can print out, you know, on the computer, I don't know how it works. But anyway, if you can print it out and you can send it in to Nick's Nuggets and we will stick it up on the wall and you can show it next week. Yeah, what you reckon, Nugget? You want to do that as well? Okay. Oh, he's a good boy. You're a good boy, Nugget. Now remember, don't play with that fire next time. I nearly burnt my whole hand off. Okay, good boy, Nugget. Have a good week, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching Nick's Nuggets. Bye. Say goodbye, Nugget. Bye. Oh, he's a good boy. Bye. Our Bible reading for today is from Romans chapter 14, verses 13 to 19. Therefore, let us no longer pass judgment on one another, but rather determine not to put a stumbling block or an obstacle in a brother's way. 
I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. If your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food one for whom Christ died. So do not let what is good to you be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God does not mean eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which produce peace and the things that build up one another. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Uh, this morning, it's my privilege to introduce a friend of mine to you. Uh, joining us from the United States, from Dallas, Texas, is Dr. Sandy Glan. Uh, she is a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. And with all the, the stuff that's going on around the world and in the US, uh, we thought it might be good to hear from someone who's there. Uh, and she's got a special place in her heart for the northern suburbs and for Playford here. Uh, she came and preached to us, uh, I think, about four years ago at Christmas time. Uh, so it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Sandy Glan. Good morning, Aussie friends. I'm coming to you from Dallas, Texas. I'm Sandra Glan. Our family loves the Rouses from their time in Dallas. Henry and Joe were just with us a couple of months ago, and Henry asked me to share a few thoughts about the country where I live, which is in a lot of turmoil. First of all, uh, COVID-19 hit its highest day ever yesterday in my county. So we are still spiking. <laughs> um, we had uh, 257 new COVID uh, diagnoses yesterday and 16 deaths in my county alone. So. I'm on day 75-ish of a lockdown, and I think I've been out of the house maybe three times. Interestingly, though, um, there's a whole sense from the right-wing political party, which has had a lot of influence on evangelicals. There's this idea that if you wear a face mask, you're giving up your freedoms, a lot of conspiracy theories. And so even though our church is meeting, they're not requiring face masks, which means our family is still pretty much on lockdown. My husband and I are both over 60. Our daughter had open heart surgery. We're all three of us in high risk uh, categories. So um, the good side, I mean, the upside of COVID is we're seeing a lot of online Bible studies. Uh, I was able to do one and I was joined by a friend in India and um, you know, parts of the world where I usually don't get to see my friends. So. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've experienced too, the technology has been great, but it's, uh, we're, there's no end in sight here for that. But obviously the bigger issue that's been happening in the last couple of weeks has been related to racism. Uh, you may have seen in the news, because I know our new, you get more of our news than we get of yours. I'm sorry about that, our loss. Really, it's our loss. But uh, there was a, a black man who was out jogging, which he normally did, and a father and son felt threatened, thought that he was a burglar, and they killed him. And not too long after that, a police officer, you know, just pressed on a black man's neck for long enough for him to beg and say, I can't breathe, and it killed him. And police brutality is a problem. Uh, it's been a problem for a really long time. And we've had a whole lot of, of Injustice in our justice system, that's very, all the stats suggest it, it's really skewed against uh, African Americans. And so this was sort of the tipping point. There have been plenty of police, police brutality incidents, but this, this was the combination of the two of completely innocent people captured on film. So in both cases, nobody was really going to do anything, but the film went viral and they had to fire and charge people. And so, um, a lot of people are protesting, including students at Dallas Theological Seminary, where I teach. Um, my husband and I would be out protesting, too, if uh, we weren't under a COVID watch. Because um, the problem is real, and peaceful protest has really gotten us nowhere. Not that 
we at all believe there should be violence, but the violence on the part of most people has, uh, it's, they're a combination of factors. There are some who are joining the protesters because they like a good rumble and are hoping for a fight. There are others who are white people who go in and start spray painting stuff. And, you know, when everyone gets arrested, the white people get released <laughs> and the black people stay. And so even that is a, a, a privilege in that, you know, you can, you can destroy property and not worry too much about your future and it can hurt those around you and you can be completely oblivious. So there's a lot of that. Last night's protests pretty much across country were peaceful by the time you see this, because I'm Thursday your time, uh, Thursday morning your time, Wednesday. Uh, anyway, by the time you see this, who knows what will have happened because we have a, a few days between us. But um, our downtown area, including where Dallas Theological Seminary is located, is under a 7 p.m. curfew. So there's no going out for dinner. There's no staying outside. You can't really even be on your front porch. Um, so a lot of the country is on lockdown at night. Uh, it's pretty crazy. And you ask, why would evangelicals tolerate the kind of leadership that we're seeing? And there is such a focus on the pro-life movement that it's like you, uh, we feel like a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ just don't see any other form of injustice. And so pray for us. <laughs> um, we've prayed for you lots of time. Now we're lots of times we're asking you to pray for us. Pray that the gospel would go forth. Pray that justice, you know, that we would, would do justice and love well and walk humbly with our God. Uh, the church needs you to pray for us, um, that God will be glorified through this, that the church will be a uniting force rather than a dividing force, that God would open all of our eyes to see where we have tolerated injustice or since it didn't affect us, just not worried about it and have failed to try to make a more just earthly society because we've been so um, convinced that it's not real because it doesn't affect us. Thank you for your prayers. Appreciate you. Wherever I go, whatever I do, pray that I rightly divide the word of truth. Wherever I am, wherever I'll be, Pray that I'll give all of the glory to the one who set me free wherever I walk, wherever I rest. Pray that I would be a servant and that others would be blessed wherever God might have me at the time that he's placed me on your heart. Pray I'm only following the bright and morning star. Pray for me. Pray for my persecutors, pray that I'd fear God and never fear the face of man. Please pray for me, pray that the object of my heart would only be the desires of the great I Am. Wherever I go and whatever I do, pray that I'd rightly divide the word of truth. Wherever I am, wherever I'll be, pray that I'd give all of the glory to the one who set me free wherever I walk and wherever I rest. Pray that I would be a servant and that others would be blessed Wherever God might have me at the time He's placed me on your heart I pray I'm only following the bright morning star Pray for me And pray for my persecutors Pray that I'd fear God and never fear the face of man Please pray for me Pray that the object of my heart would only be the desires of the great I am. Please pray for me. 
Oh, and pray for my persecutors. Pray that I'd fear God and never fear the face of man. Please pray for me. Pray that the object of my heart would only be the desires of the great I am. Let's sing together, God, I look to you. Well, it's really good to be, uh, to be with you again, folks, and uh, it's a Wednesday night, uh, and so it's funny, this goes out, as you know, on Sunday, 
And it's hard to know what the world will be like on Sunday. But I know the world tonight is one that has a lot of us uh, just really shaken up, I think. Really shaken up. Um, the events that we've been seeing unfold in the United States um, and the response that you may have felt, the things that have stirred you, that have, that have made you cry, the things that have made you angry, the things that have had you thinking, why? All of that. And so it's so good that we had Sandy, who was able to be with us uh, today. And, uh, it, you know, it's a really important season for us in the life of the, as the whole church particularly in these moments where we are still, in a sense, a little bit isolated from one another, which had me enjoying last Sunday's service when we prayed, oh, sorry, when we read the reading uh, and we saw our people, folks. Some of them you may not have known who they were. Maybe you hadn't had a chance to meet them in the flesh. But every person who spoke, a child of God, Every person who shared something of that passage loved by God. And I wonder if it's so easy for us to forget those things, my friends. We see a world that has forgotten the value of a human life. We see that in our local community. And folks, we're going to read from Scripture. In, well, we heard Henry read the message and uh, I'm going to share a bit of a word with us around a really significant chapter of the Bible that, to be honest, I hadn't really seen much of. I don't know if I've ever actually preached out of it. When you're a youth pastor, you tend to have your key things. I don't think I ever went to Romans 14, but it's been such a rich week, as it has been every week, but such a rich week to be considering what God might want to say to us out of today's service. And it's all about how the community accepts one another. It is all about how we value one another. And I've got to be honest, I mean, Gabe last week said that we struggle, I think he used the words, we suck at some of these things. Well, the reality is Jesus as our example, as our Lord, seems to have a life that at times we just struggle to really uh, emulate or to, to express. And yet the reality is, folks, he's far closer than we think. His life in us by his spirit. So hopefully this is a word of encouragement to you today. And before, now that it's a very long introduction, let me just roll in. We're going to be taking in a moment from Romans chapter 14, verse 13. But I just want to take us back to Romans chapter 14, verse 1. And we're told this. This is speaking to these, these this, this is speaking to a church. So folks, if you're new to us online, or you're not really connected with church, but you're interested or you're intrigued about faith or God and you're coming with questions, hopefully this would be a really interesting message for you to get a sense of what life within the body, within the church might look like. Begins with this, welcome him who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of arguing over opinions. Arguing over disputable matters, arguing over doubtful things, arguing over reasonings. Folks, have we lived in a time in human history where everyone has not only got an opinion, but feels that their opinion is right? Do you live in your home with someone who you think might be opinionated? Have you ever been accused gently, graciously or harshly as being someone with strong opinions? Are you yourself opinionated? Even this week as I was preparing, I wanted to Google uh, and listen to some uh, inspiring music. So, of course, it was a YouTube site. And, of course, YouTube has your like and unlike buttons where you can give your immediate feedback as to whether there's something that, in your opinion, is right, in your opinion, is, or is liked or unliked. Now, in this message, I was listening to what was described as the world's most inspiring and uplifting instrumental music. Two hours of only the best musical mix. At the time I listened to it, there were 2,084,379 views, of which 14,000 people agreed and said, yes, this is the world's most inspiring and uplifting instrumental music. It is only two hours of the best motivational music. But then there were 1,000 people who said, no, I don't like it. I don't know if they didn't like it because they didn't think it was the world's most inspiring whether they didn't think it was uplifting, whether they didn't agree that it was instrumental music, whether they didn't think that the two hours was really two hours, or whether they even thought it was the best motivational music. 
immediately we have this opportunity for us to give our opinion. And I don't know about you folks, but it feels like everyone has an opinion. And maybe that's not a bad thing, as we'll discover. But these opinions and how they're expressed and how we deal with people who have an opinion different to ours is something that through the church we're invited to grapple with. And that's what Paul would have us for. Even when we started streaming on the YouTube site, uh, we had one dislike. Now, I think I might have been preaching that weekend. And so it had me wondering, what was there that wasn't likeable? What was there about the whole service? I was just letting my family, I was just saying, isn't this hilarious? Trying to say it was hilarious. We've had a dislike. And it was at my point, my youngest, Bella, piped up and said, actually, I think that might have been me. I meant to press like, but I accidentally pressed dislike. So I realised, now, whenever someone dislikes it, they've probably just made a mistake. They probably really liked it, just clicked the wrong button. But here in the early church setting, folks, we aren't talking so much about general opinions on things that are happening in the world. But we're talking about people's opinions on what is vital and crucial about how we should live as followers of Christ. Of how we should live in the light of who Jesus Christ is and what his saving grace means in our lives. What it means to know Jesus. That's who we're talking to. And the reason Romans are so interesting for us is that this is, as I said, this church has come together and there are two distinct groups of people, really. There are the Jewish Christians and then there are pagan Christians. So there are Jewish people, faithful Jewish people, or maybe not so faithful, we don't really know, but Jewish people who, who heard about Jesus Christ, invited him into their life, became Christian and are now looking to live his way. You've also got Christians who weren't from Jewish background, quite possibly were from other pagan religions, maybe no religion at all. And so they bring with them a whole, some things that perhaps the Jewish Christians didn't share. You see, Jewish Christians, for the most part, still held some of the same dietary and calendar laws, such as the Sabbath. So there were days that were important. The Sabbath was one of those. But the others... Our pagan Christians didn't hold such beliefs or lifestyles and they even went as far to suggest that if you still believed in those things and, and, and did those things, that that was a weakness in faith. It was interesting that Paul doesn't speak to them as Jew and, and Gentile because quite possibly there were Jewish and Gentiles in both sort of sides of that, uh, of that story. But the issue was not so much what people were choosing to, uh, the, the, the actions they were choosing to make. It wasn't so much the dietary laws were the problem or that the Sabbath laws were the problem. It was because each person, each group thought that they were right and they thought it was their job to convince the others that they were indeed wrong and they should be more like, more like them. So that's why we have that first, the opening passage. Welcome them, welcome, the, uh, welcome him, welcome her, who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of arguing over opinions. Our first step as the body of Jesus Christ is to welcome, without seeing someone as an opportunity to make into my kind of image or convince them of some new things and try and suggest that what they're believing is, is not entirely true. And I'll just read on. Welcome them who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of arguing over opinions, things for which the Bible has not clearly specified or clearly expressed. For one has faith to eat all things, but they are weak, uh, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. And do not let him who eats despise the one who does not eat, and do not let him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has welcomed them. The mention of eating vegetables is not a, an, an attack or at least an encouragement for vegetarians, those people who just don't eat meat. It was that the Jewish people saw um, certainly bacon and ham and pork was not to be eaten. It was something God had said not to eat. And so you can almost imagine for a new Jewish Christian, uh, the thought of eating a bacon sandwich was horrifying it would almost be like that if they were to tuck into a bacon sandwich for breakfast, that the guilt that they would be feeling would, be, would overwhelm the faith that they had recently come into 
the new belief and trust in Jesus Christ. And so we see this dynamic where the people, um, people were looked down on f- for still having some of those beliefs and some of those actions. And they were probably called legalists. And then those who saw themselves as being strong in faith judge, and were people who, didn't see, who seemed to have freedom to, to eat whatever they wanted to, um, we call them something, here's a word for you, antinomianisms or antinomianists. Or maybe look it up. I'll, I'll get Daniel to put the word up and you can do some research about that. It's basically someone who says that everything is free now. Something along those lines very much so. So it's interesting that Paul uses this, this idea, this concept of being the strong and the weak in faith. I think all of us might imagine that we are the strong ones in faith, or maybe, maybe not all of us. But I'm so encouraged that Paul speaks to this community and says, all of you are on a journey of faith. God has welcomed all of you. So why are you looking to one another to try and fix them up or make them more like you or or have them think your way? We can get here. So the thought we have here from Paul is that the mark of of mature faith or growing in a strong faith is, is how you understand the freedom that comes in Christ, the freedom that we have in him. That's why a person says that, Paul says that the person who understands the truth of what Jesus has done and who Jesus is clearly is one who's strong in faith and one who doesn't understand it clearly is weaker in faith. A guy called William Barclay, who brings some wonderful insight into the scripture, said this, and he's talking about those that might be determined or described as being weak in faith. He says this, They have not yet discovered the meaning of Christian freedom. At the heart, they are still a legalist, seeing Christianity as a list of rules and regulations. Their whole aim is to govern their life by a series of laws and observances, almost frightened, he describes, of Christian freedom and Christian liberty. Also suggests that there's another way of describing what it might mean to be weak in faith, as someone who hasn't yet freed themselves from the belief that their works are what God really wants. That in their heart they believe they can gain God's favour by doing certain things and abstaining from doing other things. Basically trying to earn a right relationship with God and not yet accepting the way of grace. Still thinking of more of what we can do for God than what God has done for us. Do you get that sense of what it might mean to, to, to still not fully grasp the freedom that is in Christ Jesus? Someone once described that Romans 14, 1 to 12 says it actually gives one another the freedom to have different opinions and different convictions. How about that? Some of us might think that the, if you join a church or become part of a church, you have to think like everyone else on everything. And the reality is, and I took a little while to get there, sorry, but the reality is there's a whole lot of stuff in the Bible that God isn't really clear about. Where you should live, for instance, isn't in the Bible. There's a whole range of things that God doesn't specifically speak to in Scripture that are our opinions. How beautiful that in the the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus gives us the freedom to have different opinions and convictions. How beautiful to know that you do not need to have an opinion about someone else's opinion. Doesn't that sound freeing just for a second? You don't have to wade in on every discussion. But Paul doesn't stop there. It's not simply about recognising that others, about the uh, the things that aren't part of Christian doctrine, the the, the things that the Bible expressly describes and, and, and points to us as truth, Romans chapter 14 goes on to say what we do with that situation, how we are to be together, holding different convictions and different opinions about some things 
in the whole breadth of Christian understanding and, and of Christian life. And so Romans 13 to 22, which I'm really going to get to today and I'll move through, is describing how we actually limit our freedom that we have in Christ for the good of others. And I'll explain what that means. Um, Paul's instruction to us is found in verse 13, as Henry read. Um, He says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother or sister's way. There's a bit of a wordplay here in the Greek language, of which we have our English translation from. But the words judge and determine are the same Greek words. So we might say something like this. Therefore, do not pass judgment on anyone, on another anymore, but let us come to this judgment. Let us decide this, that we will not put an obstacle or a stumbling block in our brother or our sister's way. We will understand that our choices and our behaviour when it comes to what God requires of us is not to be imposed on somebody else. And let me read verse 13 as we heard from Henry. Therefore, let us no longer pass judgment on one another, but rather determine, make the decision, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or an obstacle in a brother or sister's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean. And that was the issue in the earlier part of our reading was, was that the laws were to keep us clean, that the eating, the dietary laws and the Sabbath laws were all about keeping holy, for God is holy. And so Paul's saying uh, um, that nothing that God has done, not Lord Jesus, that, no, sorry, nothing is unclean in itself. Jesus even said himself that it's not what goes into someone that makes them unclean, it's what, what comes out. But to him who considers everything to be, anything to be unclean, to them it's unclean. If your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food one for whom Christ died. So, let, let, so do not let what is good to you be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God does not mean eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For they who serve Christ in these things are acceptable to God and approved by, um, by men. What, what, just pause just for a second. In this case, we have that situation where s- someone understood that they were free in Christ to eat whatever was before them. And for some people too, the issue around the meat was that it had been sacrificed to idols. And we read about that in, in other parts of Scripture. And so the question was, if it's been sacrificed to an idol, should I, should I eat it? And, and there were some within that community who understood that there was nothing that was unclean. And so they were free to eat. But Paul's saying, there's a now a higher calling for you than before. Freedom in Christ, and Henry's going to touch on this as well next week. Freedom in Jesus Christ is understanding that I am now free to not put anything in your way, to to encourage you to see your growth and your encouragement and your life in Christ as something I would do anything to help. I would do anything to support and encourage you in. So if for me, and go back to this Roman situation, if for me eating a bacon sandwich in front of my young Jewish Christian was going to have them, it was going to jar their conscience. And here's here's how it would have played out for them. The example would be a young Christian, an older, well, maybe more mature Christian, as we've heard, mature in faith, says, it's fine, I can eat a sandwich. And the younger one's looking at them eating the sandwich going, well, if you can eat a sandwich, maybe I can eat a sandwich. And then they tuck into their sandwich and suddenly as they're eating, their conscience is seared almost. It's almost like they're thinking, I shouldn't be doing this. And as I said earlier on the message, that was a bit early, but earlier on, it was, it's almost like that guilt and that feeling of I shouldn't be overwhelms the faith in Jesus Christ, the hope they have in Christ, the freedom they have. And so it's, it's really interesting that Paul is wanting us to understand that freedom in Christ does not mean just doing now whatever you think. It's actually understanding how connected you are to one another and how my role and my actions are all about encouraging another. 
Um, I just want to I'll just give you an example of that. I've got a, a book down here. Because you might be thinking, well, what a, what a crazy thought that freedom, that we would ever limit our freedom for the benefit of someone else. We live in a world that actually says personal freedom is the absolute goal. We don't like, well, generally our world doesn't like anyone suggesting there might be a different way than you're choosing. Our personal freedom is, is vital. But have a listen to this. This is from a book, uh, James Ormond's, a friend of Henry's, well, a lecturer that Henry had, Henry had when he was in the States. And he's, he's written a book all about Romans. And he's actually called it Accept One Another. The heart of the, uh, he understands the heart of the book of Romans is about how we are to welcome one another in Christ as God has welcomed us. We'll get to that. So he says this, You may ask, as others have before, why the strong should limit the exercise of their freedom for the weak? Well, the answer is the strong always limit themselves for the weak. In mountain climbing, the stronger members of the team always move at the pace of the weaker members. If they don't, then the whole team risks disaster. In a family, it's the same. When a family brings a new baby home, it's not the baby who changes for the sake of the family. The family changes for the sake of the baby. And oh, how it changes. The parents who are mature and the mature and the strong ones in the house tiptoe around the house when the baby sleeps. And when the baby awakens, screaming its hunger to the whole household, what a flurry of activity it arouses. Everyone rushes to meet the needs of the baby. And although the parents begin a program of helping the baby grow, it's not until the baby's much old, child's much older, the youngest starts to change for the older. It's always the role of the strong to change, to limit the exercise of their legitimate freedoms for the weak. And if that doesn't happen, sorry, if that doesn't happen, then disaster so often results. Now, Paul's saying not just um, stop doing things in order to encourage, like, not just, yeah, not just limit, no, sorry, not just stop things like the things I choose to eat or the freedoms that I know in Christ, maybe the things that, that are, I feel are appropriate for me to watch may not be for, appropriate for someone younger in faith to actually consider because they, you know, they're still new in terms of what God is asking of them and what, what they're learning and discovering about who God is. You can see, even as I say that, I pause, it's actually a really interesting space to step into about what it means to consider a life that is um, a life that longs after God and to live as Christ and, how, and the actions and behaviours that come from that and the way that we encourage others with the choices we make and the choices not to. Um, Paul then continues in verse 19. Because again, it's not just about what we don't do. It's actually what is encouraging us to begin to do, to walk the way of love as we just read. He says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which produce peace and the things that build up one another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but it's evil for the one who causes someone to fall by what he eats. And it's not good either to eat meat or drink wine or do anything whereby your brother stumbles or offended or is made weak. And again, that, that offence is not that... Um, well, you know how in... No doubt, for some of you who've grown up in the Christian life and are the generation above me and maybe two above me, things like, if I just name a few things, things like whether someone should dance, whether someone should drink alcohol, whether someone should have a tattoo, whether someone could have their hair long, whether someone could speak loudly in church or whether they had to remain silent. All of those things were made, may have been very much a part of your experience of growing up in faith. And if someone had to come into your community and they were very strong things in your community and your church, there would have been people very quickly who said, this is how it is around here. And I think Jesus is speaking into those very things. Let us pursue the things which produce peace and the things that build up one another. You know, it's interesting. I, I, before I began my role here at Playford, I was a youth pastor 
back in Aberfoyle Park days down south, now known as Seeds Church. And hello to Seeds. If, if you're watching, although faithful, you're probably watching your own service. But if anyone comes by, hello. And I remember we, we wanted to work with our leaders. We had a, bit, we had a large youth group there and, and we had about 50, maybe 60 leader, young leaders, sort of 18 through to 25, a bit older in some cases. And we were building this team and I'd come into this team and, and we really wanted folks to... Um, we really wanted folks to, to step up to the call, if you like, of being a leader and, and, and understanding your role working with young people. And so we listed all the things that we thought should be part of a life that actually was one that would, um, would encourage young folks, the kind of life we want to have. And, and I look, actually, try, I tried to find it earlier today and I just could not find the document I produced because it ended up being about two pages, maybe 30 different things that we decided you know, ranging from don't gossip, don't drink in front of the kids, um, and how you use your money, the places you went, all these things. And I remember giving it to, to one young fella um, and the issue he had was one that felt we were stepping outside our bounds and trying to, um, trying to say that, uh, well, for instance, I think the drinking one might have been a bit of an issue. He said, I, I don't see the problem with that. Isn't it good for them to see responsible drinking? You know, that sort of conversation. And actually said, it sort of goes against my integrity to, to, uh, to drink, uh, to, to not drink like that. And at the time, it, it kind of made sense. But what was really interesting was I feel like what it bumped up against was this, desi- this idea that I'm, I'm not prepared to do things that I think I should be able to do just for someone. That, that was sort of the heartbeat of it. What was really interesting was that these list of rules never achieved anything. It just made everyone guilty. It just made everyone realise that they just weren't probably good enough to do all this, which wasn't the intention. We're trying to call people to it. And where we ended up with was three rules. Love God, love the team, love the young people. It it took us about 18 months maybe to get fully to that point. And many of you will be thinking, why didn't you start there? But I think that's perhaps what Paul is wanting to encourage us with here today. Pursue the things which produce peace and the things which build one another. That word for pursue is what you do when you, go, when you catch prey. That was the, the term. Now, I'm no hunter, but if you're, if you're keen to track down an animal for your food, then you just got to keep going. I haven't seen any of my children do that, but I did see Josh on Sunday, just gone. We were down at Henley Beach celebrating a very special lady in our lives' birthday, very socially distant and all those sort of things. And we're sitting at this little, little, sort of like a little seating sort of area, about 50 metres from the road. Grandma had just been over. She'd just given the gifts of $20 to all the children. And then out of the corner of his eye, he spotted this $20 bill blown by the change that was coming in and racing it towards the road. Well, of course, all of us sat there, said, Josh, run after the, the money. And I've never seen him run so quick. As he pursued this and it went across the road and back across the road and he's running in amongst traffic and he's trying to cross safely but he's focused on the the $20 bill and when he came back he lifted up and went, yes! Now, that was just chasing after money. I don't encourage that. But that that goal of pursuit, that, that fixed goal on this is what I will achieve. And we're to pursue as the people of God things that produce peace and things that build one another up. You know, pursuing peace is chasing after wholeness amongst one another. As we've heard, it's laying down those things which I think are most important in a sense and it's stepping into what is best for this community. And building one another up, the language there is one of actually like a house building, building up a beautiful home. And the, the inference is, or the idea is, that it's building up a person's life into a home that's suitable for God to dwell in. It, it's actually not as simple as just encouraging someone, saying, good job, but that's a part of it. It's actually encouraging folks in the life that is in Jesus Christ. It is, it is sometimes constructive criticism. How do you go receiving that? Here's something you might want to consider. Here's something that might help in your walk. Here's something that I think Jesus might want to encourage you in. Or here's something I've found in Scripture that would really encourage you today. You know, up on our wall, we've got the language of being a church that would cultivate hope in our wide community. 
And part of the, a behaviour statement that's attached to that is it will always seek to encourage, always seeking to build one another up. So make up your mind not to put a snare, not to put something in the way of a, of a person who's developing and growing in their faith. In fact, it probably goes as far as I say, don't put a snare in the way of anybody. Make every effort to build one another up and to be people of peace and make the kingdom of God your goal. Matthew's gospel says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. For the kingdom of God does not mean eating and drinking, but is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is the life that we are to participate in. This is the life that is in Jesus Christ. As we heard last week on Pentecost Sunday, the giving of the Holy Spirit, the very power and strength and life that was in Jesus Christ now fills us. And it's not a matter of being about a list of rules or, or obligations to fulfill. It's actually the reverse. It's actually understanding that in Jesus Christ, we are in right relationship with God. There is no condemnation, folks. For the person who's listening, who goes, I feel weak today. I don't know if I'm a good Christian. This is for you. The answer is he welcomes you, and so do I. And so does this community. Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The life of the Spirit is the life we step into when we seek to honour and walk in love with one another. We actually join the work of the Spirit. It's beautiful. So let me wrap up. I think I've gone quite lengthy today. So I've just got a story that I want to share with you. And I know I've gone a bit longer than half an hour because I timed my computer to go for half an hour. So don't look at your clocks. Here we go. It's a story that I first heard as a young man and I loved it then. And I, I love it now in the context of what we're talking about today. It's by a gentleman, uh, a guy whose name was Dr. Robert Mackey. And he was the moderator of the Church of Scotland. So that's an important role in charge of that. He was an official too of what was known as the World Council of Churches. This is a pretty impressive guy in church world. Just after World War II, this World Council sent him on a mission along with two Plymouth Brethren ministers to visit the village and cities of Greece to see how the money from the World Council of Churches was being spent there. And at one extremely remote village, when they entered in a jeep because the roads were so impassable, they called on a priest in an orthodox of the Orthodox faith. Overjoyed to welcome these brothers from the larger world, the priest attempted to show hospitality by offering them some Havana cigars a parishioner had provided for him. Dr. Mackey took one, bit off the end, lit it and puffed for a moment and commented on its delectable flavour and aroma. The two Plymouth brethren were horrified. No, thank you. They said, we do not smoke. Realising that the priest had offended two of his visitors, the priest then was anxious to make amends and he went down to his cellar and came back with a bottle of his best wine. Uh, Dr. Mackey took a glass, sniffed its beautiful bouquet, quaffed the first glassful and said, may I have another? Again, the two other ministers were more, than shot, more shocked than ever. No, thank you, they said with obvious offence. We don't drink. Later, as these three ministers were bouncing back up the road in the jeep, the two other pastors turned on Dr. Mackey with a vengeance. Dr. Mackey, they said, do you mean to tell, me, tell us that you are the moderator of the Church of Scotland and an official of the World Council of Churches and you both smoke and drink? And Dr. Mackey had had about as much as he could bear. His face grew visibly red as if he would explode. No, damn it, he said, I don't. But somebody had to be a Christian. I suspect that as a rule, he wasn't a cursing man either, but somehow the situation called for that kind of emphasis. Folks, in that instance, receiving hospitality was seen to represent best what God's welcome would look like. And again, this is not 
a message around the do's and don'ts of the Christian faith. Paul's wanting people to understand that the kingdom of God is far grander than that. And that's what we're invited into, folks. That's what we're invited into. Make up our minds not to put anything in anybody else's way that would inhibit them from growing in the life that is in Jesus Christ. Make every effort to build up and encourage and stir the peace and joy to build up one another and to seek after the kingdom. I know I've wrapped it up very quickly and very tightly. But let me finish just with Romans chapter 15, verses 5 to 7, which again comes just after Paul's speaking, pouring his heart out to this Roman church. He says, May the God of perseverance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony, which means the same mind towards one another, with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may be in one voice glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, welcome one another just as Christ has welcomed you. Folks, our unity is in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's live it. Amen. Amen. Folks, we're going to move into a time of communion. And it's interesting that, uh, I don't know, can you pan with me, Daniel? Is that possible? Have I just... We're very live. Look at that. Um, It's interesting that uh, Jesus... um, Oh, sorry, Paul's words around communion, uh, what we understand as communion, are spoken of in the, in Col- um, the book of Corinthians, which I'll just find. And it's interesting that he, um, he invites them to consider this meal that we will share. And he recognises that amongst this church there are divisions. There are people who are abusing this meal. There are, it, was, it was part of a, a feast. And there were people who were getting their first and eating all the good food. And, leave, and there were people who were leaving without. And into that context, he says, you've, you've got to eat this well. And you've got to understand this is not just a matter of eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is the life that is in Jesus Christ. So, folks, we're going to share in this meal together. But before we do, we're going to um, have a song. It's a beautiful song. Uh, A bit of a new one, maybe, for some of us. Um, But it describes and and lifts up the name of Jesus as being our way maker, a way into the kind of life we've described today. And so, please, um, you can just let this song um, wash over you. You can sing along. Um, You might want to, during this time, just prepare your elements if you've got that ready. So enjoy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Beautiful. It's a beautiful song and it's good to be able to share in this meal together. And so, I've received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after he had supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So folks, would you take, take your bread and you can break it and share it amongst those who are in your, in your house. Um, and uh, we'll pause just for a moment while you do that. It's Jesus' body, which is broken for you. Let's eat thankfully. Of course, I bought sourdough, so it takes a bit longer. Now take the cup, folks, and share that amongst those, again, whom you're gathered with. This is the cup, Jesus, uh, the blood which was shed for you and for I, for the forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. You are forgiven in Jesus Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. Let's drink together. faith to move the mountains and hope to dream again we see the fires of revival the darkness giving way to light the glory of your grace burns let it burn up the night let it burn up the night
rising as all your people seek your face your life a river flowing to wash our sin and shame away salvation's tide is rising Thanks, Pete. What a great encouragement and a reminder of the importance of building each other up. Let's go into this week thinking, how can I build someone up? Give them a call, text message. You can take them out for coffee now. Anyway, have a great week and we'll see you next time.